The Sun is the center of our solar system and its solar radiation is the basis of all life on our planet. The Earth's climate system is also driven by the Sun as the climate engine. The temperature on the Earth's surface is a result of the shortwave solar radiation and of the protective shield formed by our atmosphere. It allows for most of the radiation to reach the Earth's surface, but blocks the emission of the long-wave infrared heat radiation back into the universe. This downward long-wave radiation is strongly affected by the concentration of water vapor and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Instead of an average global temperature of plus 15 degrees, the temperature would be at inhospitable minus 18 degrees Celsius if this natural greenhouse effect would not exist. The intensity of the solar radiation is not equally distributed across the Earth. The majority of energy arrives between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, and very little at the poles due to the flat angle of incidence. Due to the inclined position of the axis of the Earth in relation to the Sun, the radiation also fluctuates with the seasons. That accounts for regions with great temperature differences and various climate zones on the Earth's surface. The area where the sun rays enter at a right angle has the highest energy radiation per square meter. This is the reason for warming and precipitation around the equator. Tropical climate prevails in this zone. It is followed by dry subtropical climate both north and south. Starting at the 40th degree of latitude, temperature zones can be found. From the 60th degree of latitude to the poles, the cold zones with tundra, taiga and eternal ice follow. The borders of the climate zones also shift with altitudes. The temperature differences of the various climate zones cause adjusting movements in the oceans and the atmosphere. These global ocean currents and wind systems create a comprehensive global climate system. Fluctuations in the average global temperatures of only a few degrees Celsius have led to ice ages and warm intervals in the past million years. The basic modules of all life on Earth are carbon and its compounds. It appears diversely in nature. In the carbon cycle, it is exchanged between carbon sources, which emit it, and carbon sinks, which absorb it. Since the emerging industrial era, humans have used coal, crude oil and natural gas in order to produce the needed energy. These extracted fossil carbon reservoirs originated 100 million years ago from the carbonization of plants and animals. The massive burning of these fossil energy sources resulted in the release of CO2 into our atmosphere in addition to the natural carbon sources of the global carbon cycle. In doing this, humans interfered with the climate system, unnoticeably at first and then increasingly so. Today, burning of fossil fuel, fire clearance of woods and draining of swamps are constantly growing carbon sources. The most important carbon sinks are oceans, forest and grassland, where a lot of carbon is stored in the soil. Since the 18th century, weather and temperatures were recorded on a daily basis in the monastery observatory Kremsmünster, as well as in many other convents and observatories. These records show a rise in temperatures, in particular in the last decades. But what is the reason for this increase now? The answer lies in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. At the moment, the atmospheric concentration is 0.04%, which corresponds to 400 parts per million, abbreviated PPM. In the past 800,000 years, it fluctuated between 180 PPM in cold eras and 280 PPM in warm eras. A remarkable increase of carbon dioxide could not be detected until the 18th century. 
The rising CO2 concentration in the atmosphere leads to a constant global warming and to a change of climate. This is called an anthropogenic greenhouse effect. Temperatures rose very, very strongly after approximately 1970, if we look at the global warming of the last 100 years. There are many different theories pertaining to why it accelerated so fast. The impact of CO2 on our climate is, what I believe, best understood in climate research. We know that the natural greenhouse effect is simply reinforced by additional CO2. Water, for example, in form of vapor in the atmosphere, intensifies it even more. To find out how strong this reinforcement is, is subject of research. But what can be said with relative certainty is that CO2 will lead to climate warming if CO2 increases in the atmosphere. When the connection between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and rising temperatures was recognized, it was attempted to calculate forecasts with simplified climate models. Future scenarios were developed that assumed a certain concentration of greenhouse gases in the year 2100. In an extreme scenario, the yearly carbon dioxide emission rises from now 10 GT or gigatons to 30 GT in 2100. In the other extreme, it is reduced to zero till the year 2080 through CO2 storage. In between is a wide scope of possibilities. When it comes to the effects of the increasing greenhouse gas concentration, a lot still remains unclear. In regards to that, the 2013 report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change states, warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. The atmosphere and ocean have warmed. The amounts of snow and ice have diminished. Sea level has risen and the concentrations of greenhouse gases have increased. In Austria, the retraction of the glaciers can be seen clearly at the Großglockner Pasterze, which is easily accessible to everyone through the Hochalpenstraße where a long, thick glacier tongue could be found 20 years ago, today there is only a lake of snow melt. During this time alone, the glacier retreated by a few 100 meters. With the changes caused by the warming, the effects of the global climate system are easier to calculate than the regional effects, since small-scale circulation patterns are much more complex. The global air circulation starts at the equator. Warm air masses rise and move towards the North or South Pole through pressure and temperature changes. Through the rotation of the Earth, they deviate to the right or left. Therefore, a very strong west wind, the so-called subtropical jet stream, can be found at around 30 degrees of latitude. Between the 40th and 60th degree of latitude, there is another one, the polar jet stream, which borders the polar cold air. The air masses coming from the equator sink around the 30th degree of latitude, depending on the season, and flow back on the Earth's surface towards the equator. In the process, they deviate to the west. Consistent east winds, trade winds are formed. The sinking air gets heated up and becomes very dry. This explains why the great deserts are found in these regions. Due to the rising temperatures in the future, a movement of this dry zone to the north is expected in the summer. In the areas of sinking air, a high pressure zone is created on the ground the subtropical high-pressure belt. The Azores High, which is important to the European weather, belongs to that. The air pressure relation to the low-pressure zone around the 60th degree of latitude, the so-called Icelandic Low, determines the strength of the West Stream and with that, the weather in Europe. 
It is assumed that the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is the pressure difference between the Icelandic low and the Azores high, will increase slightly, but only very slightly, since there is a lot of insecurity here. And what we are ultimately interested in is, the storms will probably have a tendency to move north, slightly north. Forecasts regarding numbers and strength remain uncertain. There are indications that the number of storms might decrease, but the intensity will increase. It can also be explained through the presence of more humidity, which condensates and creates warmth, which is released and triggers storms. But this is controversial. There are indications, but it is not entirely certain. Since warm air can absorb more humidity, we can generally assume that the climate warming will lead to stronger precipitation intensity. If enough humidity can evaporate, more humidity is present, and as a result, precipitation intensity will increase on average. It can be assumed that the entire water cycle will be intensified. For Austria, with the Alps as a meteorological divide, the forecasts are not as clear, and they vary from province to province. Additionally, the natural deviations are much greater than the expected amounts of precipitation. Some climate scenarios show that developments south of the main chain of the Alps are characterized more by the Mediterranean Sea, and models show a remarkable decrease in precipitation here. This means that we must or can assume a decrease of precipitation south of the main chain of the Alps, mainly in Carinthia and South Styria, as well as in other Austrian regions. And then the problem of heat and dryness would be particularly widespread there. In order to show how uncertain that is, we are expecting drought that will last about three days longer, maybe instead of around 20 days, three days longer in the future. But the uncertainties lie between approximately minus 10 and plus 20, due to the contradicting physical effects and the impact of natural fluctuations. In the context of climate change, the poles grow warmer in the summer than the tropics, because due to the decline of ice and snow areas, less solar power is reflected and more is stored. It is expected that due to the smaller temperature difference between pole and equator, the polar jet stream will meander and thereby influence the weather at ground level as well. So these typical situations are then situations in which these meanders are very weak, and then we will have winds which blow through in the winter time. It is also possible that we will have very distinct meanders. These are so-called omega weather conditions that lead to heat waves, to droughts or to cold periods in winter. And some models show that this could lead to longer, consistent weather, that the persistence of weather systems would increase. This would mean that we would fall under the influence of high pressure more frequently and for a longer time. But on the contrary, if we are falling on the wrong side, it may result in week-long overproportional amounts of rain. These stable weather conditions can have negative consequences for the forest, especially in the spring and the fall. For example, a longer warm air phase from the south in the spring can lead to an early leaf unfolding, and subsequent polar cold air from the north can result in severe frost damages as a consequence. A shift of these ice man days can also be seen. The problem is, of course, that the phenological beginning of growth shifts, and on average, these movements should run parallel. But in some individual years, it can lead to an isolation, and that can cause major problems. I believe that it is very crucial that we help our forests to adjust to climate change. This is particularly important because our forests fulfill many functions and services. The forest is one of our most important CO2 sinks and therefore, of course, a part of the solution in the fight against climate change. One thing is clear, only a forest which is being managed can fulfill all functions to our needs. Therefore, it is also important that we train and educate our youth on this topic.